<laughs> Hi there. Hello there. How are you? Pretty good, actually. Yay. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> All right. I, I just uploaded the abridged version of the demos from, um, from DEF CON. Uh, so I, I did a cut that was um, focused on uh, the OpenRTX demo and then advertised the Ham Expo spot. Um, and made a cut, so it's it's up on the it's up on our YouTube, and I shared the video with uh, OpenRTX. Okay, very good. Yeah, and then I'll I'll do the the lengthier one uh, as well as actually finished, but I I didn't have time to upload it before our meeting. But usually we talk about FPGA stuff, but I have nothing except that Onshul uh, is back from vacation, and we'll get started back in on uh, figuring out how to use um, all of the all of the magical cool stuff uh, MQTT uh, from the Pluto build uh, for the for the so-called big build for the ZC706 um, but since he's been on vacation and we've been doing demos and and recovering there's not much to report from that most recent effort uh, I guess. I'm still super happy about the good news that we figured out the memory problem and can can do DMA on a really large chip at efficient levels. And hello, Christopher Swanson. Welcome. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, I, I hope I'm in the right place. I've been following along on the uh, email distribution for months and months and months. Um, well, welcome. But I'm uh, relatively new to ham radio. I, I have my technicians and my, my general designation. Congratulations. Uh, following you folks, though, is like, it's so much, <laughs> it's, it's, it's above my pay grade for sure, but I'm hoping by some osmosis, I'll, I will get more educated about um, the level of the technology and, and the way that you are, um, you know, experimenting with lots of different applications for it. Oh, well, if, um, if it's confusing, we're not doing it right. So our goal <laughs> is to make this, this stuff really is kind of hard, like the, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it is, there's a learning curve and all that, but um, we believe that it's really made out to be, made out to be much harder than it really is. And that you just mm -hmm. have to break it down and, and force it to be uh, accessible. Um, you know, I mean, there's no getting around some of the fact that the math is, is kind of icky, but you know, mm -hmm. we live in this era, this age where, uh, the, uh, the vast majority of the really gross stuff, the really scary math is abstracted into really good libraries. And mm -hmm. well, most of those libraries, so a lot of those libraries are open source and we want to contribute to that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it can be tricky, um, you know, but but there's a lot of gatekeeping and, and there's a lot of um, maybe more cultural things like academia, really likes to use these big words when they don't have to. Yeah. And, you know, most the math really can be intuitive if you just attack it with a tire iron until it gives up. <laughs> so welcome aboard. We, we're yeah. so happy to have you here. I, I um, appreciate the invitation. Thank you. You bet. Is there anything in particular that you're curious about or want to learn more about or you think we should be paying attention to? or? Well, for, uh, I have to say that from my perspective, I'm, I'm such a... Um, a, ba a basic beginner compared to what, what you folks are doing. Um, I'm just now just setting up, uh, I have an F, uh, FT991 um, um, high frequency setup that I'm trying to, uh, you know, get the antenna configuration set up properly, my grounding set up properly. So that's how basic I am. I that's usually cool. just work off my handheld and talk with people on the net and use repeaters and things like that. Um, but I'm really, I, I really like to join you guys sometime on your, your excursions and, and uh, you know, just see uh, some applications in action. Just what, okay. But I have been following along, you know, on the email string for quite some time. Find well, it thank fascinating. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, welcome aboard and you're included. Well, uh, as soon as we have any sort of excursion, <laughs> I think our 
we we learned kind of the hard way uh, at DEF CON that excursions in person are uh, can be risky because the mm -hmm. entire California contingent uh, got COVID from the show. So, oh, geez. Yeah. Um, so, well, the, fortunately, the rest, the other half of our volunteer crew is uh, fine, still fine, and looks like they're going to get away with it. Uh, so, but we lucked out in Vegas, so we we won. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, so the, our next, uh, the next show is at QSO Today Ham Expo, which is an all virtual event. So the only viruses involved are, are uh, computer ones. Um, that's been a really good show. It comes around twice a year and it has a huge variety of all sorts of amateur radio presentations of all different types. And, and so there's, there's something literally for everybody. Um, so we'll be giving uh, four or five presentations from various projects at uh, at Ham Expo, and that's in mid September. So there's a, I think there's a link recently in the in the email list. So that's our next excursion, and we we've tried to do demos there in the past. Um, and the probably the best way to do it is to just post videos at the booth or or share them or you know do try to do a little demo in the in the presentation time. You know, so it's it's kind of a different experience than if you're able to walk up to a booth and see hardware. Um, and then today, I'll, we, we're going to publish the video from from DEF CON. So we we filmed our our setup there so that people could kind of experience it mm -hmm. and see what we showed. You know, where is the, where is that going to be published, Michelle? On the YouTube on our YouTube account on the Open Research Institute YouTube the. The shorter one that focuses on open RTX and M17 is uh, is up as of just a few minutes ago. Um, and then the longer one that that shows all the all the voice demos is uh, is coming soon. Uh, and then after that, I'm not really sure, uh, you know, because COVID's really challenging and and traveling to in-person events is tough. So we are hoping that the open source CubeSat workshop will happen again. It's usually in Europe. Um, it's been in some amazing places. The the one I was able to get to, um, I think this was 2019 or 2020, was um, was at the ESA facility at Madrid, Spain, and was really good. But as you can, as you know, travel is expensive, and and getting over to to Europe from the U.S. is is tricky. So there's no word out yet on this year's open source CubeSat workshop. Um, it's run by the Satnogs people by Libra Space Foundation. Um, and it's been virtual for a number of years now because of COVID. So we're waiting to see uh, what happens and hopefully get to to join that and, and communicate with all the people that are doing similar work to us uh, in space. So really looking forward to that. Um, they were talking about it maybe being near Darmstadt, which is another ESA ground station site in, in Germany. Um, so, so very exciting. Well, I can be your chauffeur there because you can. I, I have a German driver's license. Yay! <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> and they're good for life. Oh, wow. Yeah. They must be hard to get then. No, no. Okay. This is a, if you've got a few minutes, this is a beer story. Oh, yes, please. We, that's what okay. we're here for. Okay. This is a beer story, guys. So uh, you are entitled to uh, make a beer. All right. It is uh, June of 2002. Uh, oh, yeah. We see the mug. It is June of 2002. <laughs> I am working for, at the time, Continental Automotive, uh, the Tavis uh, uh, Electronic Stability Control Brake System people. And I'm at their Michigan office here outside Detroit. And I was able to get a six month assignment to the, uh, it's actually a, 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 a world headquarters and Tavis uh, world headquarters combined in Frankfurt, Germany. So I leave in June, I get there and I wanted to get a German driver's license. So the den mother who was in charge, who was a, uh, 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 a Holocaust survivor, uh, 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 the, the, and she was in charge of all expats from all over the world, made arrangements. So I got driving lessons, courtesy of the company, uh, and just to you know familiarize myself with German roads and how things are done. And then we go to the German driver's license office, <laughs> break out the beer. 
Now, you have to understand how things are done in Germany. First of all, you do not go into somebody's office without knocking. That's just the way it is. So you go in there, you go into the waiting room, and you get a number, you know, uh, just a, a ticket number. You place an order, and you sit in the waiting room. When your number comes up on the screen, you go to the appropriate office, knock on the door, just a soft knock, and then you enter. And then there are several people in there. One person will wave at you and you go to their desk. You do the paperwork. All right, you know, show my Michigan driver's license, my passport, do all the paperwork. Then you have to pay the fee. What do you do? You go back to the waiting room, you draw the number for the fee line for the, the cashier, you wait until your number comes up, then you go to that door, knock on the door, you enter, pay your fee, they give you a receipt. Then you go back to the waiting room, draw a number. Uh, when your number <laughs> is called, you go back to the first room, knock on the door, just soft not you don't have to bang on just a soft knock one or two knocks what will do you go back into the same person you saw a few minutes before show her the receipt and then now they start processing the paperwork okay how do you know and then they don't call you they send you a mail uh, a, a notice to your apartment so uh, or, or your house or wherever you're staying so a month or so goes by. I don't remember the exact time. I get the notice and I go back there. So what do you do? You go to the waiting room, you draw a number, you knock on the door, and then you go inside to the person, you give them your document that they sent you, and then they give you your driver's license. So that's how I got it. Now, also, I should re uh, comment also that on the very first visit, you have to supply a picture. So everything takes a picture. So when I got off the plane in Frankfurt, she took me to lunch and we went to a, a, a camera shop where they took a picture because you needed it for that. And also I had the, the German national railway system, a Bahn card, uh, Deutsche Bahn, uh, which is a discount card. And you need a picture for that. So uh, the picture I've got on my German driver's license is, you know, with me after a transatlantic flight uh, and being awake for how many hours, not sleeping on the plane. Um, that's me. And also I had a mustache at the time and I didn't have any gray hair at the time. Um, so then a colleague of mine in the same situation, but the German driver's license people, the bureaucracy, they screwed him over. What they wanted him to do is surrender his Michigan driver's license. Ooh. So I don't know. I don't remember how that worked out for him, but he eventually got it. But he had to make a third trip back in order to straighten it out. And he had to take the den and mother take, with him. Take a number and knock on the door and the whole. Now, one thing you should know about driving in Germany, that in, in the states, or not in all states, but many states here in, in the U.S., they can they can use electronic means or take a picture of your car speeding, but there has to be an officer present. In Michigan, that's the law. An officer can use a camera, but the officer has to be present and witness it. That's not true in Germany. In <laughs> Germany, the camera is just set up camouflage somewhere, and when it detects that you're speeding, it takes a picture of your license plate, and they mail you the ticket. Same in California. And the ticket is not a fixed rate. It not is no a fixed ticket. rate. It, they coordinate the ticket and your car with your last German federal income tax return. Oh. So the more money. Oh, my gosh. Your return, <laughs> the greater your ticket. So if you're just a poor peasant, you'll pay a lower rate. If you're a millionaire, uh, you're going to pay a lot more money for the same violation. Interesting. <laughs> And when the and when the speed limit is posted, you know, like say 50 kilometers an hour or 75, it means 50 or 75 or 100 at ever whatever it is. It doesn't mean you know five over or 10 over. Yeah. 
and I am a member of the 200 KPH club. <laughs> on the Autobahn? Because, <laughs> because on the Autobahn from Heidelberg back to uh, Frankfurt, I hit 220 and cars were passing me. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and you don't pass on the right in no. Germany. You, you do not. So no, you know, that's just, somebody, that's wrong. That's wrong everywhere, but people do it. Yeah. So if, if what happens is if, if you're, if somebody wants to pass you, if they'll get up close to you, flash their lights, that's a signal for you to move over. And if you don't do it, they'll get close and flash their lights again. So uh, I have German drivers driving experience in Germany. All right. You're hired. We need a driver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope it. I hope it happens because um, the way back in, in college, uh, in order to, to keep my scholarship, it was a requirement to learn a foreign language and to, to go to school in that country. And I picked Austria and I picked German. So I speak a little bit of German and still I'm not bad at it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to OSCW if it happens in, in Germany. That'd be really nice. And if okay. it's virtual again, you know, that's okay. But, you know, may, if not this year, then next year, um, you know. Okay, here's here's the critical thing in German you have to remember. Eins Bier Dunkel. Yeah. Bitte. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A Dunkel is is actually important. You know, I mean, okay, yes. he, the vice beer is not bad. Oh yeah, not bad. Yeah, you know, but yeah, but there's a clear. I I have a clear favorite here. You know. Yeah, for for everybody else, I just said one dark beer, please. Very good. Good story. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Oh, and yeah. while I was there at the, I went as part of tourism, I went to the Deutsches Museum in uh, Munich, München, and they have a ham station there on the floor, and I got to operate that. Oh, cool. Right on. And in Frankfurt at the Deutsches, the German Post and Telecom Museum, they have a station uh, on the top floor there. I didn't get to operate it, but I got to visit it. But their antenna in Frankfurt is really cool. It's an HF log periodic. Oh, neat. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's huge. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of really neat museums. And um, yeah, I'm looking looking forward to being able to travel more, you know. Right. Another another place that um, that we're welcome at and, and uh, planned on, on going to was uh, the Ham Fair in Tokyo, which has been canceled. Uh, but this, this past weekend, I think they actually had it. We've seen lots of uh, announcements about really amazing equipment, including a, a, a nice radio from ICOM that works up to 10 gigahertz. And uh, Jamsat had a had their their club do a, they were there and um, uh, had a successful uh, set of presentations and all that. So that's another place that that uh, that I think we should we should go and um, and participate in. Now, I don't speak oh. Japanese, but my both my daughters do. <laughs> Oh, and really? they, uh, yeah, they they were able to uh, to help out a little bit when we when we made a presentation at Jamsat a couple of years ago. So I took uh, how one, they I, get to learn Japanese. It was what they chose to study. It's required. Foreign languages are required uh, as part of the high school here in California, just like in a lot of states. But uh, but California offers um, Japanese. So you know, I mean, I I had the I had the <laughs> The big choice between uh, Spanish and Spanish uh, when I was in high school back in Arkansas, that was pretty much the only one uh, that people routinely picked. Um, but here, it's interesting. You can choose <clears throat> American Sign Language. So my, my son picked ASL and became pretty good at it. And that counted as a, a foreign language credit for graduating high school. And he kept with it. Um, and my daughters uh, picked, picked Japanese and have gotten pretty good at it. So, so, so your son can be sitting at you at the table and just rearrange his hands with something, which is really uh, a high grade obscene insult. And you <laughs> don't know what he's saying. I have no idea. I learned <laughs> it a, a little bit a long time ago at the at the local Y that we took classes. My family did because uh, by marriage, we ended up being related to somebody who was deaf. And so we all decided that maybe we should learn a little bit of it just to, you know, uh, you know, because because her husband would translate for us, but it was we felt like we at least needed to be able to say hello and and that we you know, we care about you. Welcome to the to the to the family. Uh, so I I know the very basics of ASL and 
and it's interesting because the grammar is uh, it's, so it's not English. It's it's not a straight word for word, you know, uh, transliteration or trans translation into English. It's it's got its own structure, which that was kind of a revelation to me. So it's it's been quite the adventure with all the languages and and learning things and my, seeing my the difference. My other half, November eight, Fox Echo, uh, she worked uh, for uh, was a career AT and T phone company employee, and for ten years she uh, translated uh, on um, I forgot the proper name, but when you're deaf and you want to make a phone call, you type oh. in TDY or something to, like that. Yeah, you you type it in, and then she makes the call and then speaks what it is. So she learned American Sign Language as part of that job. Very good. Cool. By the way, uh, Michelle, I didn't see you. Were you at Dayton this year? No, no, we don't. Uh, we don't usually go to Dayton. Oh, well, you and I last met at the Amstad conference in Virginia. I think that's right. That's been a yeah, while. That's, that's the last time we met. That's right. Yeah, we went to um, we went to Hamcation, and I think we're going to have at least one project at Hamcation this coming year because it's going to be in person. The Versatune team will be at Hamcation. The, with the are you going to the uh, Digital Communications Conference? I don't think the... so. I don't have any plans to. I think it's September, October. It's coming yes, right up. Yes, it's it's September. Uh, I just made my reservations. It's the uh, uh, the uh, Tapper. Uh, mm -hmm. September 14th is travel day. 15th is Tapper board meeting. Uh, uh, the next uh, three days are uh, presentations, things like that, um, down in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, the uh, yes, yeah, the same weekend as Ham Expo, so we're we're booked for a bunch of presentations at Ham Expo. Oh, oh that is Ham Expo weekend. Yeah, usually oh. Ham, Ham Expo traditionally has been in August, but it, uh, there, there's a lot of requests to move it, move it later, and so so this time around it's in mid September. Ah, so, bummer. Yeah. Oh. Well, there's only oh. 52 weekends out of the year. I mean, and there's like, there's so many neat things to go to. So there's it's All inevitable right. that eventually things collide. Worlds. Collide. I, I don't. I think I already know the answer to this one, but in October in Minnesota. You won't be at the AMSAT meeting. No, no, we won't. We've uh, we've tried very, very hard to share our work and to submit it to the symposium. And over the past two years, it's just been removed. So we don't we don't try anymore. We're we're done. We we had an article uh, that was requested by the editor of the AMSAT journal, um, and it was submitted and it was in the draft, and then it was removed uh, a couple of days before publication. So with enough of that. You just kind of like, <laughs> yeah. You give up and move on. It's it's uh it's that's sad. That's a, it yeah, is. you're right. It is sad. We've invited them to all of the different proposals and projects, um, and we hope that they use the work eventually. And there might be some signs of life. I don't know, uh, but we're moving on, and yeah, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and and not wait around. It's uh, now. Because just from a macro point of view, uh, I get from what I understand, uh, your organization is is a science based organization. So you're not aiming you you if it flies great if somebody uses it great, but you're not going to go out and try and build a bird or get it launched. You're not a you're not a fly organization. You're just a science organization. Yeah, we like solving problems and publishing designs and doing um, regular yeah. like reg regulatory work that's in the way of organizations that want to build. Um, we can build parts and pieces. And actually, if you look at all the folks that are at ORI, we have a lot of stuff in orbit already, uh, either commercially uh, for through work or previous AMSAT payloads. You know, so. I mean, yeah. we, we have stuff and we have a proposal for a high earth orbit for an open source high earth orbit satellite that'll be presented at Ham Expo, um, you know, or the, the work in progress will be presented at Ham Expo. But this is a proposal for a complete satellite that's designed to be accomplished and built with partners. So, no, we wouldn't try to do the whole thing ourselves. Um, we just want to supercharge any organization that it, that wants to build 
Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, and I just know? noticed your shirt. I have to say, I love your shirt. I just noticed it. <laughs> and this, it's cool. <laughs> this is I got. I found it on um, uh, Amazon, and and it's on the back too. Let's see now. It, it doesn't it, even repeat. Like it's not a repeating pattern. It's no. a whole bunch of stuff. And it's. Every... I'm so sorry to interrupt your conversation. I just had to. I just know. I was like, it's circuits. It's great. It's every subject every one of us went through for undergrad <laughs> electrical engineering. Oh God. <laughs> including some mechanical stuff because it's got like oh, yeah, spring spring. here, uh, uh, you know, and there's some, uh, you know, mechanical stuff here. Yeah, logic. And there's chemistry. Oh yeah. Chemistry and, and there's some pictures on here and on the back is, oh yeah. And there's a, uh, uh, this is body sent. Uh, this is, uh, you know, um, mechanics, uh, you know, how, uh, Atoms are arranged yeah. in uh, crystalline Crys structures. Crystalline structures, yeah. And, uh, you know, Ooh, there's statics some... and dynamics, and it looks yeah. like some. And on the back is Kirchhoff's <laughs> Bit voltage error rate. law. Oh, boy. That's the good and, stuff. And so the... you just got that on Amazon? This is, we yeah, live in engineering a... t-shirt. We live in a golden age. This is just. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and it's really nice when, when you wear it to the uh, club meeting. The oh, radio yeah. club meeting. I bet and, it gets uh, some attention. Uh, Does it have antenna stuff on it? It has to have antennas. No, not really. Oh, well. Not that I've found so far. The search will have to continue. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's an but, almost perfect t-shirt then. Yeah. Uh, so, but it's, it's, it, it's really a, a nice shirt. It um, is. Uh, oh, doggone it. Oh, yes. Cyber. Uh, I'm still active, even though I'm retired, I'm embedded software engineer. Yeah. I'm still active in the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, cyber yeah, you were the team. one that, you're the one that raised up that's the standard for uh, software quality for, for embedded work. Uh, repeatedly, well, you brought, you've brought this up repeatedly that there's, uh, there are standards for embedded yeah. software and that, you know, they are very compatible with the sorts of things that we want to do. And one, one of the, the major software pure software standards is, um, and this is something you should check out uh, for anyone that does C or C++. It's the Motor Industry Software Reliability Association, MISRA. And it it's, was aimed originally at C and C++. Now, uh, it's not what it is designed to do is for embedded applications to keep you out of trouble because it's, it's um, uh, CPU agnostic, it is application agnostic, uh, it is project agnostic. What it does is says when you have an embedded application, say in a car, which is where it started at, but it's gone, all kinds of industries are using it now, it says, Okay, I'm picking an example from memory. When you have an if statement, even if that if statement is only one thing, if blob, then blob. Uh, you know, if blob, then do this. Well, if the do this is only one command, you know, A equal B plus C, that's your do this, that's your executable. You shall have it in brackets, no matter what. Don't just say, don't just write it all in one line. You put it on two lines and you will have brackets around it. You, if you have uh, order of precedence execution, you know, we all remember my dear Aunt Sally, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. You do not depend upon the compiler to get the order of precedence correct. You will use parentheses even uh, if there's any possibility of multiple interpretation or it does it its own way, or instead of doing it by order of priority, it does it left to right or right to left, or there's a typo error, you will use parentheses. Uh, so this is just, this is like a series of best practices for, yes, and, for the actual source code, for the, the focuses yes, on the source code and, and making it to where the compiler doesn't have to do any extra work, that we don't run into well, any weird you know, problems, that sort the of The purpose thing. of it is 
to not depend that the compiler got it right or the yeah. linker got it right. Right. Uh, no magic numbers. Yeah. So, no magic yeah. number. If you have a number, it will be defined in only one spot and it will have a pound defined with it. And in that yeah, pound we should... defined, even it's just, you know, uh, you know, pi equal, you know, pound define pi or pound, de, you know, define Michelle as 10. The number 10, <clears throat> all right, is it signed, unsigned, short, long? All that will be in parentheses. Yeah. Because when that number gets translated into wherever it's going to be used, it's it is you you don't want it uh you want it to go over in the the you know short signed unsigned long yeah. you want it to go over in the correct format so now, you, now we should probably pause here and and explain about magic numbers and i bet that paul has an opinion about this so would you like to tell us a little bit about your uh your understanding of magic numbers and and maybe uh, share your opinion on these uh, standards, the this, this style of standards, since you have a background in, in a different type of embedded work. Well. <laughs> it's different. Cellular, cellular phones are different type of embedded challenge than automotive, but a lot of the stuff that, that he's raising here from this particular set of standards, I think, uh, it, it's it's going to ring a bell, but maybe you yeah. can you can help define what magic numbers are because we've gotten bitten by magic numbers before. Yeah, okay. Magic numbers are definitely a problem. A magic number is just when you insert the literal number in the code, possibly in multiple places, and uh, often without any explanation. And this is no good. <laughs> There's lots of opportunities for for problems caused by that, and it's a very common sloppiness because it's easy to slop down the number and say well i know what this number is that'll that'll be good enough um some of the other things are more a matter of opinion and what's most important is that it be consistent so that the next uh, author or editor of the code knows what to expect and can look for anomalies but the ad using always using brackets after an if is mostly a matter of opinion not according to Misra. Well, they have their opinions. <laughs> have their well, opinions. One other thing about the, the Misra <laughs> standard is that many compiler manufacturers have incorporated it into their tool set. Yeah, so it's a common. You, you can you can see it if you if if anybody listening to this is interested, you can you can tell you can just search it up. It's a it's something that crops up over and over again. I'm yeah. kind of on the. I'm definitely in the bracket camp as a as a writer. Maybe because of the era that I was taught C programming, where the brackets were were the thing. Like, and so I'm I'm all on board because it yeah, makes well, it easier for me to understand and read and the syntactic sugar and the shorthand and the the all like you. I think you brought it up the all in one line, which lets you do the if if thens very quickly all you know and, and compactly. Uh, bugs me. And I, I don't, I know that I don't have a very good reason for it bugging me, but it just, it makes it harder to maintain the software. And I think that that's what Misra is after is that they really want it to be maintainable. Well, it's not only maintainable, but also when you follow Misra, it becomes human readable, much more human maintainable. Also, it will do things like, uh, 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 things like no uninitialized pointers. If you have a pointer, it must be initialized before you use it for the first time. And the tools that uh, the various compiler manufacturers, when they incorporate in there, it will scan for that. Now, when we did, I was on the software team for Oscar 85. Uh, that's what I brought to the team and we started doing that. So when you do your code reviews, the compiler will generate error messages that says you, you broke this Misra rule, you have an uninitialized pointer or uh, 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 some other, you know, there's like a hundred, over a hundred different possible things and it will flag every one. So now when you do your code review, you now have to pay attention to that. Is And many times there were a couple instances when we spotted an aw shit, that if it had flown with this code, 
it would have bricked the satellite. Unrecoverable. Uh, it, it, you know, totally unrecoverable. So, um, uh, and of course, in automotive, that just cannot be allowed. So the, the goal of MISRA is uh, maintainability, uh, uh, compiler, it doesn't care what the compiler is, application uh, uh, agnostic, uh, trans, uh, technology agnostic, uh, and many, many industries have adopted it as a requirement. So that's one thing. But I also wanted to ask you, Michelle, uh, since you are, uh, a lot of the projects you're working on, have you designed in from the get-go any sort of cybersecurity or taken that into account? Oh, I think that's a, another area that Paul can, can speak to directly um, because we have an entire poster session, paper presentation coming up uh, specifically about security uh, issues. I'm, I'm going to call them security issues, uh, but but I'll I'll pass the microphone over to to Paul to explain. Yeah, there's it's sort of new because most of the work we've done in amateur radio up till now has been on analog channels, and there's just not that much you can do about security, much less cybersecurity. Uh, but as we move forward to more digital systems, then there's lots we can do, and the mm -hmm. poster session and uh, proposal that Michelle has referred to as uh, a way to authenticate every user on a digital communication system channel at low overhead using standard industry cryptography techniques, uh, but without ever transgressing on the, uh, the rules and regulations that require that you not encrypt any actual user data. Um, it's yeah. all pretty much straightforward stuff. I'm going to be creating a presentation for ham expo on this over the next few days hopefully now that i'm more or less recovered from covid and, oh sorry uh, to hear that yeah yeah it was kind of a bummer but i got the Ooh. magic uh, antiviral and now i'm uh, on the road to recovery good 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 possibly um, gave him superpowers it's possible um i would like to invite you uh everybody to the Society of Automotive Engineers has several cyber committees, and one of them that I'm on is um, it's called Cyber Physical Systems, and it's a joint automotive and aerospace committee. So, uh, and for aerospace, we don't care if it's an airplane or a satellite or whatever, and it doesn't. It we, we treat cybersecurity from a high level systems point of view. That is, we are application agnostic, technology agnostic, but what we say is you shall do blah, 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 blah. You shall not do blah, 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 blah uh, from a high level systems point of view. And we're working on and publishing standards. Uh, one of the committees that subcommittees that I lead is uh, illustrative example for electric vehicles. But we have on the main committee, this main cyber physical systems, we've got uh, uh, representatives from the Department of Defense, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, the various national laboratories, uh, corporations. Uh, some of them aren't, you know, like uh, uh, one is deals with uh, water purification, uh, transportation. So it's, it's really a broad based industry. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like any of these sorts of applications that the committees, uh, or is it a working group? I'm sorry, committee or working group? The, the yeah, well, it, it's right now, uh, we have, we published version 1.0, 1 1.0 of, of, the, of the standard. Um, well, I, SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers doesn't call them standards, they call them recommended practices. Okay. Yes, yeah, it highest. sounds. It sounds like all of these could incorporate some sort of digital communications, right? Yeah. It, it's. It's. Yeah. It's what it is. Uh, is it's not only communications. It's, for instance, uh, uh, how do you secure your development environment? Even before, so you've got. Oh, okay, so it's not just about the protocols. It's also that the, the whole workflow. Yes. Uh, all uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, risk management. How do you define your risks? Uh, what are the negative consequences if you uh, don't do it right? Uh, uh, 
uh, how do you to secure your development environment? So because, uh, for instance, open source code, a, a lot of open source is notorious for uh, hacking, not only to allow people to get in and do things they don't want, but man in the middle attacks. How do you, how, how do, you do that? What, what should you be doing? And we don't care in the standard what kind of protocol you use. In other words, do you use uh, for password for key distribution? Do you use someone with a piece of paper that walks around and hand carries it? Uh, do you use electronic distribution? Do you use the US mail with a piece yeah, it of It sounds paper? like as, as long as the particular function that you're saying needs to happen happens, then it, it then the actual, you know, the form yeah. used to carry out that function is right. So, local option i mean it like like you said because like i just recently had to get a paper letter for an id check for a government deal and it's like wow we're okay so we're we're going to send a letter to my home okay you know and but i've also had to use fancy you know crypto authentication apps you know with secured devices so but all of these different forms are all serving the same the same function and they all are, are acceptable, you know, it's, right. it's like the, which goes back to what you said about risk management. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you kind of establish, and that's actually something that uh, for the, for our particular work that we're doing for authentication and authorization for this particular transponder um, is that we spend a lot of time talking about the threat models. So right. like you can, you can spend an awful lot of time optimizing something for a threat model that's vanishingly rare and it might be fun uh, and all, you know, but you need to balance it out. If you're, if you end up with a protocol that's too heavyweight, that no one is going to really use, or a too onerous of a, of a, like for example, like when you talk about development environments, we want people to be able to contribute to to projects, whether it's professional environment or open source environment. We yeah. need people to be able to pick up and and to power through to muscle past the gag reflex of the learning curve as quickly as possible and you know like get your visual studio code <clears throat> environment up and running and get it secured in as with as little friction as possible you know and that means right. balancing out the risk and the threats with how much work do you have to do after you right. install visual studio code you know if it's going to be days of onerous right. it fiddling or you have to get sign off of six or seven people at your work just to get started. And then it's all locked down and you can't install any other yeah. extensions. I mean, you've, you've lived through this. You, you understand yeah. how it, how it can go, you know, and that's, this is yeah, just it, a, this is a, it's really, so are you, I have a question then is the standards that you're, or the, sorry, the recommended practices that you're talking about, are they kind of addressing this in a dynamic sense? Are they talking about how to evaluate it? Well, what no, what they're saying basically is uh, it's, it's just a list of requirements that says you shall do this and you shall document it. Because when you're dealing with commercial, whether right. it's aviation, automotive, aerospace, these That's are you know, really critical. vital. <laughs> yeah, they're safety critical. <laughs> Nothing exists unless it's documented. Right. And it's safety critical. So, you know, yeah, uh, no, it uh, goes back to what I think Paul was saying about it. Just it needs to be consistent, like just. Yeah. The consistency so, has to be there. And a lot of it is documentation, not, not only to show what you did, why you did it, how you did it, who did it. Uh, and this is not even taking into account the design. Right. <laughs> separate, because then you yeah. still got this whole bunch no, of documents. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Then you've got to actually design, mm -hmm. you know, or write the code A equal B plus C. Right. So before you even, so, you know, whether it's before or after, uh, you write A equal B plus C, all right, you've got this voluminous amount of documentation so that if a jailhouse ambulance chasing lawyer comes after you five years from now and says what you did killed my client or, or made them a paraplegic, you can haul it out and say, well, yeah, not only did we write A equal B plus C, but here's everything we did to make yeah. sure that it was done correctly and that uh, no one hacked into it and that uh, it was reviewed. Uh, yeah, this and is the this standards. is this is a real threat model for automotive. This is oh, yeah, well, this is well, why this is a huge deal, and also aerospace. Oh yeah, um, you know. We so can't have I mean, airplanes falling out of the sky. No, so I mean, it is a different sort of. 
it's a different set of challenges than just simply having a communications link, you know, but the good practices from that are hard one, <laughs> very hard earned and tested, oftentimes in court over many years, yeah. um, are things that I think we should all uh, pay close attention to, you know, especially sure. because it, it, you, it's not like y'all want to uh, be inefficient. I'll send you, we have uh, our meetings are for the main committee are every uh, Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time for one hour. And what we're doing is we're just brute forcing our way. We did version 1.0. Now the people, it's been out there a while. Uh, now there are uh, additions, subtractions, corrections, modification. And we're just brute forcing our way through these hundreds of, of, of changes. So oh uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit on the boring side. I <laughs> Bar send you well, so some people might find it boring, but it's... It, it is boring and <laughs> it's mind numbing in the detail because you get engineers yeah. and I even see this in my subcommittee, we'll spend 10, 15, 20 minutes discussing one word. That's right, because it's important. Yeah, but you... you that's, the way, uh, that's the way stuff happens. This is how you get good documents. One of the main contributors of, of my electric vehicle committee is retired 32 years Royal Canadian Air Force electronic warfare. Oh boy. And the another committee I'm on, a software committee, the chair is PhD Airbus Munich, Germany. The vice chair was 25 years Lieutenant Colonel Israeli Air Force. Oh wow. And he was in charge of all the software that flew on their F-15s and F-16 fighters. Wow, what a remarkable It's a high-powered high panel. <laughs> yeah. It is. That's, that's a remarkable set mm -hmm. of people to have all working on, on, on the same thing. Yeah, it's... we on other committees, we have the FAA is there, uh, DOD is there. Uh, and the, so the whole, Andrew. the goal is to, to create best practices, to kind of capture software quality for, for embedded, is, is it mainly embedded or is it's, this yes, broader aimed, than that? It's aimed at embedded. Okay. So because this like is it, really quite amazing because there's there's a big, okay, so the reason, one of many reasons why this is so cool and I'm so happy that you're working on this and is that over in the AI ML side of things, um, there's a, a lot of concern over how to regulate artificial intelligence and machine learning. Oh, yeah. And the main problem that crops up over and over again is that it's it's not really even the artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms that are the problem although there's problems with those because they can have bias that is severe they can have weird they're not deterministic so it's like lots of question marks and stuff they work and they work really well but we're not sure how and why but that's not the problem the problem is the the basic underlying software that's used to deploy these algorithms, what standards do they use? So if it was held to some sort of testable best practices, proven oh, yeah. stuff, yeah. then then you would eliminate not all of the problems, not all oh, the yeah. problems because the algorithms themselves may still have, and the data, if you have incomplete or biased data, you're gonna get incomplete or biased outcomes. But if we could just get like a best practices mindset for AI, AI ML, the same way that we have in the in the areas that you're working in, automotive and aerospace, where it's recognized as we got to test, we have to have practices, we have to have these groups, right? If we can kind of like smear it over, you know, then I think so we we would have so fewer problems. We would we would have mm -hmm. a big improvement. It doesn't yeah. solve all the problems, so it's not magic pixie dust, but it's partial magic pixie dust. It would mm -hmm. actually because this keeps coming up over and over again is it's like, well, you know, it's not a problem with AI ML, which will end up, if it fails, it will end up scaring people. Uh, it's a problem with the underlying software quality. When you slap something together and rush it out the door to be first to market, then you cause problems. You can cause catastrophic problems as mm -hmm. your industries have found out many decades ago. Oh so yeah. You already yeah. went through this. You already yeah. learned it the hard way. So, Which is why don't buy a Tesla. Because well, he, how come he, he lets the customer do his software testing? There does seem to be a lot of that. It, it <laughs> took a different path than the traditional right. in, sort in of autom in, in automotive. We freeze the software. We say that this is 
production intent, we're going to do this roughly a year before you can buy the car. Yeah. And then we, we, we spend. And is that not what Tesla does? They don't do that? Uh, they do. I'm not really sure. But they're having so many updates in the field where when we freeze it, then we'll take it out. We're going to beat it to death on the test track. Then we're going to take it up to the Arctic Circle uh, during the winter or in Michigan up to Lake Superior or northern Minnesota during the winter and beat the heck out of it in the, in the winter. And then in the summer, we're going to take it to Death Valley, California, and beat it to death in the desert during the summertime. And, um, and we're going to accumulate a couple million miles of testing before you even get to see the car. And during yeah. that time, any of the bugs, and there are bugs, uh, we're, going to, we're going to find that out during that time. We're going to correct them so that when you get it, the number of bugs that you have is really low. Now, that doesn't guarantee it's, it's cyber proof. It, it's not hackable. But what it means is the chances of that car or killing you or injuring you or getting into a serious event where, you know, it is, is very, very low. Well, as low as you can possibly right. get it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not an absolute number. Right. Uh, but it's, it, but we still No, that's true. And that's, that. that's something that not a lot of people understand is that especially with I mean, any sort of software that's complicated enough to do something interesting is complicated enough to be almost unguaranteeably <laughs> insecure right. at yeah. some level. You know, it's an asymptotic, you know, you, you, you work really hard and you can get it down to a, a, a pretty low level, you know, but we're talking about, you know, there's millions of lines of code in cars. Oh, yeah. now. And, 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 a, and a modern car these days can easily have 50 computers in it. Easy. 50, yeah. 50, five, zero. <laughs> wow. Now, also, um, uh, one thing in one of our committees that we do have, we have a, a representative, a member of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They're working on how to crack quantum computing. Yeah, that's a big deal. And they're, they're, they present. But how is that any, is it anywhere, I guess, from an automotive perspective? What, well, no, what is it? It's, it's not it... anywhere near deployable, but it. But what at this point in time? But what they're trying to do is we we're, we're trying to. I, I hesitate to use the word future proof. I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, good. that's yeah. really we're, it's we're like we're waving about... a red flag. <laughs> right. But, but but the but the intention is good because you yeah. don't want to like. I know I know what you mean. I, I right. So I, I, what, but I also to totally understand the hesitancy to say future proof because you, you're just asking for it. <laughs> right. What, and what what has happened, what they're doing is they are currently working through proposals for algorithms that says if uh, how can you uh, under quantum, because quantum will be able to crack anything that's out there today. Well, uh, yes, yeah, yes, brute force. Br but yeah, the, you... it's the brute force part that's the, that's scaring everybody because it just it completely plows under all of these built in like, oh, well, you know, it would take uh, a thousand years to, to solve this particular problem. So you're safe using this particular cryptography hash thing. And the banking industry is like, good, thousand years. That's no one will ever try it. And then if quantum computing works out like we think it milliseconds you know or seconds yeah. and, and it's so, the, that brute force leverage thing is really scary and what they're working on is a set of standards to have new quantum proof yeah, yeah. Well, this, this made the news because they had a competition for different algorithms and yes. one of them got one of them got pinged pretty hard because it they overlooked something that could be solved with a essentially yeah. a, a raspberry pi so yeah but the rest of those, I mean, that was just one out of the seven, I think. And yeah. it's, they're working, yeah, but they're, right. they're working hard on it. This is, and it's being reviewed and as widely as possible. And oh, yeah, I think we're, we're going to see some, what they call post quantum algorithms, you know, yeah. which, I mean, so the work that we were doing for authentication and authorization, it uses hash functions and uses some Diffie Hellman key exchange stuff. Mm -hmm. And for our threat model, this is totally fine, yeah. you know, but. The, the repercussions of quantum computing are that the, all this stuff that we know how to deploy and do um, and that we rely on for, for you know, simplistic things like, like simple communications links in the amateur service or 
banking, you know, or, you know, sensitive information oh. is going to have to change. Speaking of digital communication, one of the things that is going on right now, it's a standard called Uptane, U-P-T-A-N-E. Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was at the, the last Uptane in-person meeting here uh, uh, a couple months ago here in uh, Detroit. So, you know, they hold meetings every, every other week or something like that. Uh, uh, you can, it's, it's open to everybody. If, but oh, that, cool. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, would you? I can send you the contact information, and so you can participate. But you'd you'd find it really cool because they're actually working on the standard. Oh, the standard. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Version one of the standard, it's already out there, and and for everybody else's benefit, Uptane is a standard, and I believe IEEE has taken it over. That says when you want to do over the air updates. And it doesn't matter. Yeah. Over the air, you know, of you, you've got 50,000 cars out there. Yeah. You want to update it. or, or, or 5 million cell phones or a constant or your or a constellation in, in yes, space or even your favorite Oscar satellite. How do you do that? What, what yeah. not only, not only take into account how you, uh, you know, the, the actual data itself, but what's going on in the, in the target and in the source. How do you protect all that? And speaking of open yeah. research, uh, Paul, I like your shirt. Where'd you get that? <laughs> oh. Well, of course, I got it from the Open Research Institute swag store. Oh. I will, I will put the link in the chat. I like that shirt. Yeah, it's not bad. It's a, it's a really... It's a really tie-dye kind of... Yeah, it's, it's, it's real tie dye. It's not just looks awesome. Turned it to look oh, like so things. what? What happens if we wash it? It's going to fade. <laughs> no, I'm use the right inks. Ah, but no two are alike. And so actually, they actually tie it and dye it. Oh, all right. I think that's it's a uh, from Gold Medal Ideas, all one word dot com slash ORI. It's a uh, the Gold Medal Ideas. I, I if you've been if you have been to a ham fest, you have seen them. They do embroidery on hats and shirts and all sorts of stuff. And they're uh, great. They're a, a, a really wonderful company and uh, travel all around the, mostly the Eastern half of the United States. That's where they're, they're based more out there. Um, but they, uh, they have our, our U S swag store. So you can get that shirt there. And there's also a couple other different colors of uh, tie dye. But yeah, it's, it's a fun shirt. Paul gets a lot of comments about it. And it makes them easy to find in crowds. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, I can just see that now. Uh, the largest outdoor art fair in the, in the Midwest is in, in, in the city of Ann Arbor, which is about an hour to the west of where I'm at. And it's the home of the University of Michigan. And it's one of the most liberal counties in the state. They do have a few retrograde uh, people from the evil party there, but they're <laughs> in the extreme minority. And I won't name names. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's a very liberal town and I could see that, uh, you know, oh, walking yeah. around with that T that t-shirt there during the uh, art fair. You bet. It, 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 <laughs> it, by the way, if anybody is ever in the state in Michigan, uh, during the third weekend in June, uh, it, it's a great time, uh, especially, uh, Chris and Paul hint that, uh, if you wanted to get something nice for the lady in your life, hint, hint, hint that, uh, <laughs> Uh, this would be the place to do it. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> Support the local economy. Oh no, these these get people from all over the U.S. All, all over. I mean, it's huge. Oh, it's a famous and, famous art fair. This is a yeah, Michelle. A big, I mean, it's a big deal. <laughs> if, yeah, if you wanted to get something nice for yourself or some nice artwork for the home, for the house, but how some of it is only moderately, you know, uh, you know, a hundred dollars or something i've seen works there up to ten thousand yeah that's a it's a good it's good stuff there's yeah. a it's one of the one of the nationally known known shows for for art oh yeah open yeah i i see i i'm at the swag store now uh tie-dye 22 dollars yep. yep and it's good good cotton shirt right paul it's a paul is has a has a purist approach to shirts 
And um, I've he's, he's rubbed off on me because, you know, being somewhat agnostic about uh, the t-shirt fabric, but now I'm solidly more on the, if it's hundred percent cotton, it's okay. You know, <laughs> and anything else. That's a minimum. Yes, it's a minimum. So I've, 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 I've this is heavy hundred percent cotton. This is good stuff. Very tough. Yeah. It does have a little, there's a hole in it somewhere due to a, some kind of weaving defect that I think might've been a soldering issue. Actually, I think you had an encounter with soldering. <laughs> that's, a, that's how I'm going to explain it to people. Uh, Wait a minute. Were you wearing long <laughs> pants when you did the soldering? Oh, see, I've learned that the hard way twice. <laughs> <laughs> learned that the hard way twice. I don't know why. Sometimes the only way to learn things is the hard way. That's right. Yeah. For, for those of us, the little slow, you know, on the, on the, on the pickup. It's a lesson uh, you never forget. Well, well apparently I did. <laughs> At least oh, you once. Did. <laughs> yeah, because I had to I had to learn it twice. Don't uh, uh, wear no, long what? pants when you're soldering and don't yeah. Don't yeah. get distracted and yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been able to do a lot of soldering. Um, you know, okay, so most of our eyes work is is like FPGAs or software or stuff that you, we would send out and get built. And and there isn't a whole lot of soldering, but to kind of make up for it, um, I got a, a subscription to Hacker Boxes. So if you are looking for really cool kits that you, oh. there's something you have to solder every month that is really fun, that incorporates, you know, Arduinos and, and, um, and you know, Raspberry Pi, uh, it's, you know, type uh, processing or ESP 32s or any sort of, and lots of cool actuators and sensors and fun things and, and little swag. So they're in little boxes. It's a subscription service. So hackerboxes.com is you should check it out. So <coughs> if it's in your budget, it's, it's not bad. I think four oh, bucks cool. a month. It is so fun. I've learned yeah. so much about so many different things. They've done everything from like biomedical, like here's a, like a fingerprint reading kit that you put together. So you build the circuits and you program it and, and they walk you through everything. And it's very positive because they like tell you, you know, working with embedded stuff can be frustrating, but just hang in there and just keep at it. And, you know, approach it with a uh, with an open mind. It's like, wow, that is the best advice for embedded work because there's always something you're like, you, you know, you can never really win when you argue with the compiler. You just never win, really. <laughs> it's just, oh. you know, and you just got to keep trying. Back away, walk away, come back at it with a fresh approach, and they're like, ah, that's that's the problem. So it's just been a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great company and a, a great kit. And I don't get paid to endorse them or anything, but it's like it fills in this gap. Like I don't get to do a lot of soldering, really. Um, and and this is this has really kept me pretty pretty busy. And a lot of the stuff, like we used um, one of their previous kits, and it was a a little tiny board, maybe about yay big, that was a Wi-Fi access point. So it's a complete Wi-Fi system on a chip, the size of a large stamp, with two LEDs on it. And what we did is we uh, tricked it out and used it as a hidden web server at the DEF CON booth. So if you oh. walked up to the booth and you you could log in to our demo station that Paul set up. Um, which showed like SDRs and, and, you know, waterfalls and here's, here's all the digital communication stuff we're working on and you could see it, but there was a hidden web server. So if you logged into the web server and you blinked the little LEDs, which was pretty easy once you figured it out, uh, then, then you won and we, it was like a miniature capture the flag competition. That was from a hacker box. And that wasn't even the whole hacker box. That was just something thrown in with like seven or eight other doodads. So it's just been so much fun. It really... It, it, like I said, a huge variety of different um, sorts of, of things, everything from entropy, randomness, the study of like how exactly do you make random numbers with the circuit because it's, it's much harder than you think. You know, pure mm -hmm. random numbers are difficult to do. And when you have to have high precision randomness, like really guarantee random, then there's only certain few ways that you, you know, you have to you have to be careful in managing it. So they had a whole box devoted to that, um, biomedical, um, and just everything in between. Some communications, uh, and ever so often there'll be some some digital radio stuff. Sub gigahertz uh, was a was a good box. So if you're interested in that, it, just check it out. It's it's uh, it's really 
really kind of, and also it adds to your stash. So if you are the sort of person that needs to build up your stash of electronics <coughs> parts, I know none of you do, you know, but we've over time just to accomplish things in the lab have uh, raided the, the, the hacker boxes. It, it is essentially like a parts cabinet of, of embedded stuff. It's, it's all very much embedded computing themed. Um, speaking of embedded, you know, of, uh, Neat projects. Uh, are you aware of the um, uh, uh, Nathaniel W two NAF on his space weather project, where he run out of the University of Scranton? Mm -hmm. Have you participated in any of that? We tried to. We uh, donated some time to the project. Oh yeah, their uh, conference is coming up. Um... Oh, they just had it. They, yeah, I think they, it's in the past, but there. Yeah, it's there'll be the another past. one next year. Yeah. So it's worth it's uh okay, get it on your calendar. Yeah, aware of it. Very good. All right, we've been at it for an hour. I'm I'm gonna go around and see if we have any last things to talk about and then shut it down for the week. Uh do you do this every week? We do office hours as, as often as we can. Usually the slots for FPGA work, uh, but because it's uh, we're coming back from all sorts of demos and, and um, uh, vacations and recovering from various uh, viruses, bleh, um, we decided to just throw it open. And so usually, I think we'll have at least one more this week and we'll have at least one of these a week just at various times we try to move it around so that uh, different time zones can can make it because uh, time zones are actually one of the biggest challenges uh, for us given the teams are are scattered around the world so yeah just i'll i'll try to give um advance notice on the on the mailing list and on slack yeah if you're not on slack then just let me know and i'll make sure that you have an invite or a refreshed invite Let's see, is there anything going on in remote labs? I think um, the remote lab South that's in Arkansas and they are making progress towards a FDA, FDA uh, grant to hold a workshop, a, a scientific meeting about bacteriophage. So if you're, if you're interested in finding out more of that, we have a, a mailing list called Aquaphage that's um, at the, you can find it off of the mailing list uh, page on our website. Um, but they are working hard on, on upgrading the physical plant there. During the summer, it's a lot hotter there than it is here in California. So I've been cheering them on from air conditioning <laughs> as they do things like roofing uh, and uh, you know pulling cables and things like that. So it's, space is going to be really neat. It'll be it'll be fun to see that come together. Anything at Remote Lab West, Paul? Any anything that you know about since you got back? No, nothing going on at Remote Lab West. Um... At it's Remote Lab South, news. they've just upgraded their internet capabilities. That they have a local co-op that got stood up to provide fiber to the home, and so they've got brand new symmetrical gigabit fiber, which is great. Uh, we're still trying to work out all the consequences of the carrier grade NAT that they're providing uh, to get in the way of networking on that service. So some additional work will be required before that comes back online with the new higher speed that's what's going on tactically there's lots of stuff in the longer term yeah cool looking forward to to that i don't think we have we don't have that quite quite that same speed here but um pretty good we have a gigabit down but not up yeah all right any last words christopher i just want to thank you all for letting me join in the discussion very fascinating to me you know i'm a neophyte compared to where you folks are at but i'm, I'm trying to learn as much as i can and i really thought this is a, a great conversation today oh thank you yeah we'll we'll do it again mm -hmm. and uh yeah anything that you're that you're interested in or or you know want uh want to learn more about that's what we're here to help with so thank you and uh you're, thank you're, you. a, you're a full member welcome aboard awesome <laughs> All Thank right, you. Jay, any last words? 7-3, good luck in the contest. CQ <laughs> contest. CQ contest. You're your 5-9 Michigan. CQ contest. <laughs> Very good. All right, see you again next time.
Bye-bye.